welcome back to my channel. My name is Rachel and that is the R in the RK Stumbling Bear and I am a reader and a writer. And welcome back to week 19. So my mood readingness has definitely hit <laughs> as you are about to find out. I finished two things this week and the first was the Giants of the Violet Sea by Eugenia Triantafalu, which is a Greek name and I don't speak Greek, so that I know was butchered. Sorry about that. But this is one of the novellas that was nominated for the Nebulas. This was published through Uncanny Magazine, and so I'm going to leave a link to it down below since you can find it online. This is a science fiction story, or this is a science fiction setting, because it's set on a different planet many years in the future, you know, from people who had left Earth. But the focus of the story is dealing with death and fear and being okay with who you are and stepping forward and claiming your space. This follows Themis, who has been called back to her home village because her brother has died. While she is there, she's trying, she's dealing with the, what she does remember and what she has tried to forget and trying to reconcile her present and her past and her future as she is tr dealing with her mom and the circumstances of her brother's death. In this world there are tamers of a creature called the Vinny Dolphin which I think is supposed to be like a venomous dolphin because this world a lot of plants and animals are poisonous to a certain degree and the humans have adapted to live in this environment. Her brother was a tamer who swam with the Vinay dolphins and he was discovered to have been poisoned. Nobody is quite sure what happened because he was well loved by the pod like by the Vinny Dolphin group, they trusted him. He had, he had swam with them for years. And these Vinny Dolphins, they create what they call an ink sac that at a certain maturity can be knocked off or fall and then humans can use to do ink. And Themis' society, they use them for, they tattoo people when they die to help them return back to the heavenly waters. I'm probably butchering that. But there are other uses of this ink as well, and that is in illegal drugs. And so you have poachers. Themis is thinking that poachers have killed her brother, and she's dealing with these thoughts as she's dealing with her broken relationship with her mother. The world and the setting of this is just beautiful and breathtaking and I really enjoyed it. If you haven't read this yet, please go read it. It's definitely worth your time. I am definitely going to be looking for more things by A. Eugenia. I'm not even sure if I'm saying that right. I, I think I'm pronouncing it the Spanish way, not the Greek way, but definitely I'm looking for more things by this author. So far it looks like she's done a lot of short stories. But if she ever wanted to publish a novel, I would definitely be interested in reading from her. And then I was in the mood for another romance. And I wrote A Lady by Midnight by Tessa Dare. This is part of her Spindle Cove series, which I read some of the books from already. And I just wanted something that was short, sweet, and I could enjoy. And this follows Miss Kate Taylor and Colonel Thorne. It seems that all the men are from like the military related in this series or based around this town, at least that I have found. Uh, but the idea of the Spindle Cove is supposed to be like these unconventional women who are known, some many who are known as spinsters are there together in one town and that they are just living their best lives that they possibly can away from the confines of society who thinks that they have failed because they are not married and it's about them finding love and being willing to stand up for the love that they want and this was a lot of fun 
Um, it was dramatic and over the top, which was kind of what I was looking for anyway, but it was a world that I had already stepped into and I knew other characters from. And something that, that Tessa Dare likes is she actually brings contact in with the past heroines, which makes it a lot of fun. And now you're probably thinking, but what about what you were reading beforehand? I made progress, I promise. I got to, I finished the first part of Fear and I'm on the second part now. I am enjoying this. My husband actually is reading a book about World War II from the people who experienced World War II. And so we were comparing notes, just kind of noticing how between the warfare between World War I and World War II, how it affects the soldiers, that hasn't changed. Maybe the instruments of war changed and where World War I, you had trench war fighting, World War II, I'm pretty sure they moved away from that what the soldiers are actually going through, that element hasn't changed. War. Why do we do this to ourselves? Seriously. I'm enjoying this. I just don't like it when it goes literary on me. And what I mean by literary is it all of a sudden starts to get purple prosy. And I'm just like, ah, you were like, I was flying through these pages as you were describing like injuries and what the war is actually like. And then when he's talking about then like the character starts to like philosophize on war and what it means and go into deeper meeting and that's when it gets purpley. I'm just like, oh, shut up, please. Also, I don't know if this is was actually the author's point of view, but the character's point of view is very misogynistic. And when he talks about women and their simple minds, I'm just wanting to beat his head in. I'm like, you're an idiot with expletives so that makes it a little bit harder to want to read this when I'm like just shut up just shut up yeah just shut up <laughs> and I did continue to make progress on The Unbroken by C.L. Clark I'm really enjoying this whereas with fear I can like read little snippets throughout the day this is something I want to read in bulk I want to have a huge bulk of time and just sit down and read this. And I don't always have that, which is, I think, why I'm making less progress on this. So I'm not promising that I'm going to be picking up anything else this week because I want to finish these two books. Now, I know that the one book that I really, really wanted to read for the May of the Moderns readathon is How Do You Live by Jinzaburo Yoshino, and that is available at my library. And so, so I might be getting to that this week. I'm supposed to be reading it with a buddy reader, so I'm going to have to check in with her and see if she's re ready to read it or whatnot. But yeah, I'm, I'm making no promises because obviously I'm not doing well. So on to my writing wrap up. Still in the daydreaming phase. This kind of goes with the seasonal depression where it's hard to get up in the morning and the morning is the time I set aside for writing so if I don't get up I don't write and if you're asking yourself well why don't you just write at a different time of day yeah that's a great idea I'm not a night writer when I, f I can force myself to do it and I do during NaNoWriMo or if I'm joining in with sprints but it's like my brain goes to bed at, at five o'clock when I get off work and I'm in just pure relax mode. Don't want to do too much else. Yeah, I know. It's all excuses. But I have learned that it's better sometimes just to let my mind have its time to itself. Because I'm not coming up with things that work for stories I already have in progress. And so daydreaming is good. It really is. And then for other media, I think I must be in a drought this week. I really enjoyed the podcast, uh, Writing Excuses. This last episode was about collaboration. They featured Megan Lord, I think is her name, who is a storyboard artist. And then just going back to my time in film school, uh, storyboard is where you take the script and then you draw pictures to kind of represent what that will look like on screen. 
and this includes kind of what the costumes are going to look like, camera angles, lighting. It's basically a blueprint to then, then hand to the director, the cinematographer, and costume director, like everybody else to be like, hi, here you go. Here's what you can potentially do. And a lot of storyboard artists do work with the, these heads and the director to kind of get things down ahead of time. And if you if the storyboard artist or the storyboard is done really well, it, it makes filming go a lot faster because you already know what angle you're doing the, the scene at. So it takes less brain thinking to complete things. I just like on student films, like we would do make sure we had our story, but we would make sure we had our storyboards done and it was really easy then to just go, okay, we filmed this, what's next? All right, adjust the camera, uh, lighting, actors in place, go to do the next part of the scene or the next scene even. It helps you then to know, like at this setting, what all scenes are gonna be taking place there. So then you can work more efficiently. So if you have a scene that's at the house at the beginning and then at the house at the end, instead of filming the beginning, filming all the other stuff and be like, oh, we need to go back to that house. You're already prepared to go. Let's just film the beginning scenes. And then, oh, we're already here and using the set. Let's now film the ending scenes. So what the storyboard artist does is very, very important. And I enjoyed the discussion with collaboration. It was interesting then to learn how Arcane, the storyboard artist had five years, whereas as Megan said, she normally gets six weeks, or she, yeah, she normally gets six weeks to, when she's given a project. Just fun, interesting stuff like that. And I found it very inspiring and yeah, la da da. So there's a reason I keep making sure I listen to this podcast every single week. Because I really enjoy it. My husband and I caught up on last week tonight with John Oliver. Yes, he's a comedian, but what he discusses is not always funny. There was one episode that we watched that was talking about environmental ra racism and how you can see a lot of the redlining districts match up with what the industrial zones are. So basically we're putting black and brown people in industrial zones and saying, this is where you get to live and hell to your health kind of thing. In fact, I remembered reading Goliath during while I was watching that episode because it talks about Cancer Alley in Louisiana and in the show it mentions Cancer Alley in Louisiana which just goes back to if you haven't read this it's near future go ahead and read it it's hard-hitting enjoy it it very much shows that how organizationally in the United States and in other countries all of our policies have been based on racism and not wanting the other around and that's not okay and so in order to change all of this we have to change everything you can't just change two things on the surface and be like oh look we're doing so good no everything has to change because it is embedded in everything and it reminded me of discussions i had during my master's program for library for librarian and information science that we talked about how the library has been a racist organization and how librarians now are working so hard to change that, especially in minority communities where they're trying to get libra librarians that look like the community members so the community knows that this is a place for them and it is a safe place because that's not what a library always was. So I guess I can give you homework this week, kind of like writing excuses does is where do you work or where do you spend a lot of your time if you're a student and kind of look and see what elements and policies are in place and are they equitable how did those policies come to place you will probably discover that where you work or live or spend a lot of your time that they have racist policies that are still in place that gives you the opportunity to reach out to others near you and work to change that. 
I know in the, in the United States, everyone likes to put a lot of, oh, the president, the president in Congress, they change everything. That's really not how that works. It, it's really a local level. So if you want something to change locally, you get to be the change. Your local politicians are going to be more amenable to listening to you because you vote for them directly. So I guess this is also another plug, vote in your local elections. In my community, we, ha we have an election every year. And this year, it's our, you know, it is state and federal, but it's also county. And then next year, it's gonna be city and school board. So when are the elections in your communities? And are you voting in all of them that you can? Trust me, those local people are way more important to your general happiness and surroundings than the president. But that took a very uh, turn away from books, and I'm sorry for that. So how was your week 19?